Welcome everybody to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. We're broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Don't worry, it's only a drug and the effects will wear off momentarily. My very special guest <laughs> is Rick Simpson coming at, coming at us live and, uh, and chortling. Welcome to the show, Matt. PhoenixTears.ca. <laughs> Great to be back with you, Vinny. <laughs> Always a pleasure, brother. Hey, um, I want to just jump straight in here, Rick. Um, uh, what was it? Weren't there a couple of states in in in, in the USA that have uh, just legal just just legalized pot, like in the, in the last uh, month or two? Yeah, in uh, Colorado and uh, what was the other one? Colorado for sure. They've made some massive changes there. I thought it was you Washington. Know, like the, uh, maybe it was Washington. I'm not just sure of the second one, but Co- Colorado was definitely one of them. And uh, yeah, the doors are opening. There's no damn question on this thing. But, uh, you know, the other day, uh, well, yesterday, there was a, a segment, uh, the Ricky Lake Show. They had that seven-year-old on there, and Cheryl Schumann was on there. But you, you almost have to laugh at these Americans, you know, because they, they can't come out and say, you know, it cured me, because they're all afraid they're going to go to jail for saying it. You know, but not once did they mention that, you know, that this child was cancer-free. And, uh, you know, I, I was kind of disgusted after watching it, you know, but what do you expect from the mainstream media? If you want truth, you got to go to the Vinnie Eastwood show. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do feel that that way sometimes. In fact, just as little as yesterday, Rick, I read out all these headlines um, from uh, the New Zealand mainstream media, and there's nothing of actual national significance in the national news media in New Zealand. Like, seriously, right. this is a nationally significant news story in New Zealand. A bakery burnt down. A small bakery. <laughs> Right. Right. <laughs> National catastrophe. A dude drives. A dude has a, has a car accident and goes to hospital. That's national New Zealand news. Well, it's not much different here in Canada, Vinny. I mean, it, it's just all distractions, you know. Let's not talk about anything important. Let's just give them all the bullshit we can to distract them. Unfortunately, so we're, we're under FCC regulations. You can't say that word. You have to say BS instead. Okay, BS yeah. instead. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. With, with BS instead with the gravy on top. <laughs> no, but it, it, it truly is pathetic what's happening here. And, you know, they're still just dancing around this issue as, as usual. But, but you know, I am I am seeing things happening here. Like I said, you know, there's, there's good things happening in South America. And I was shocked here a while ago. I just found out, uh, from what I understand, Iran is it is legalizing cannabis now islam is totally against you know like uh, liquor or you know narcotics or anything like that from what i understand iran is legalizing so i was very happy to hear that i have uh, an anecdote to actually share with you the uh, the uh, editor of this magazine uh, uncensored uh, magazine uh, my good friend john eisen um, he yeah. said that back in the uh, back in the 60s uh, and 70s and stuff like that um, a lot of authors actually moved uh, to the Middle East because they were uh, allowed to smoke hashish there. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> well, it's a long-standing tradition in the Middle East. You know, it goes back a few thousand years. But uh, how, much know, I, weekend, I, how much weekend yeah. violence and crime and, and, uh, and, and uh, divorce and, and all of these other alcohol-related uh, 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 social problems do they have in, in the Middle East, I wonder? Well, I'd, I'd be willing to bet their marriages are much happier than ours. <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, I looked after um, uh, an autistic boy for a, uh, a Muslim couple, and and uh, so so very reserved, but but very 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 friendly, and and um, and, and just kind of, just kind of like they never wanted to offend any anybody, sort sort of thing, you know, just very conservative. Right. Yeah, they're they are they're very nice people from what I've seen and the people that I've met, you know, from that part of the world. But, you know, any place that's, you know, coming forward and bringing this forward, I, I'm in favor of it. And um, but, it you know, it, it's just horrifying when you, you see what's happening in the United States and Canada. And it's no better in Australia and New Zealand. You know, I mean, the people got to get off their asses and say that, like, you know, why don't like why, why don't they just take the, the real experts on this in this field? You know, Bob Malamede, Lemir Hanoush, uh, Dr. Mishulin, you know, bring them before the public. Put them in these big auditoriums and televise it, and let's have a long discussion about what this medicine really does. 
You know, I, I don't mind bring, stepping forward and telling the public what I know about it. And I don't think these other experts would mind doing it either. But I mean, we got to we got to clear the you know, the, the, they keep muddying the water, you know, and we, we, we've got to get the water clear so people can actually see what the hell's going on here. What I've noticed, Rick, is the the power of a phone call. Right? Mm. Studio's about to have somebody on. All of a sudden, he gets a phone call. And that person's no longer on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and also, you know, um, thinking about this, like it would be cool to have a, a, a televised... It wouldn't even be a debate. It would just be essentially a, a series of, of lectures bringing the dumbed-down, lied-to, manipulated, uh, illusionary uh, general public... Uh, into the knowledge of, of what cannabis can really do. Um, it, it reminds me of the third party debate. Uh, did, did you see that one? Uh, no, I didn't see. Okay, well, you know how there's generally only two candidates that you ever see as part of a debate? You know, they're either Democrat or Republican. Right. Well, they had a third party debate with all the other um, uh, people from the uh, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, the Freedom Party, and, that, and so on and so forth. Um, and instead of uh, screaming, uh, fuck, yeah, there's a lying scumbag, shut up, there's like eight lies in that one thing that he said, um, it's, it's more like, oh god, this is so awesome, actual debate with real facts, and almost every single one of the candidates wants to legalise pot, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was like basking in the radiance of of exactly what you wanted to see and wanted to hear. And ironically, this is the first third-party debate that's ever been organised in all of fracking history. And guess what? They had Larry King from Larry King Live, and they yeah. couldn't even get that televised. That's not surprising. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, they're doing anything they could do to try to keep a lid on this, hold it down. But, I mean, it, it's busting loose in so many different directions now, and there's so many people screaming about this. There's no damn way they're going to hold it back. You know, and these dumb governments, like the government here in Canada, Australia, you know, the U.S., you know, when the people really come to realize what the hell's been done to them, how are the people going to react? And could you blame them if they went and hung every damn one of these fools? I mean, we're being ruled by nothing but psychopathic damn criminals. You know, they're not working for us. So why the hell are we supporting them? And why do we pay our taxes? Why do we do any of this? You know, I don't mind paying taxes, Vinny, and I believe in law and order. But, you know, if my tax dollars are being stolen and, and actually being used against me, I'll be damned if I'll pay them tax. I've had enough of them. What I would love, uh, ideally, in terms of a tax system, is voluntary. Okay, so paying taxes is voluntary. And if you do volunteer to pay taxes, a, a, a portion of your income, kind of like a tithe, you know, to a church, you know, a church doesn't, um, yep. uh, whatever, um, and then they give you a spreadsheet and uh, little tick boxes of what areas you want your tax dollars to go into, um, you right. know, and, the, and there'll be certain boxes that very few people will tick, you know, like service foreign debt to criminal banks, uh, <laughs> uh, funding foreign wars, um, <laughs> COINTELPRO on people that are trying to free the country, yeah, I'll fund that, you know. Uh, that or healthcare or anything. I reckon that'd be really cool, like a, a, a democratic tax system. Yes, but then again, yeah, you'd need an educated, our... you'd need an educated and informed public in order to operate that. We don't have that yet. Well, I mean, it's our money, and we should have a say as to where it's going to go. You know, we can't trust our pol elected political representatives. So I think everybody should just get together and say to hell with you. We're not paying income tax until we see you doing something sensible with this money. You ask anybody, where do your tax yeah. dollars go? You know, how much? Did, how much did you pay in tax? Well, I paid sixty thousand dollars in tax. Really? What did they do with that sixty grand? Well, I, right. pres I presume it's on the roads or anything like that. No, bro, that's why they have petrol tax. They don't spend. They don't spend your tax dollars right. on the roads. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, I guess they probably spent it on medicine. No, bro, the medicine's all privatized by a bunch of uh, criminal, ruthless, psychopathic pharmaceutical industries, and they just basically bought up everything and and uh, and lobbied the hell out of everybody in there. And now you got a man mandatory Obamacare and stuff like that. They don't know where your taxes go. Uh, well, where are my taxes going then? Servicing the debt on foreign banks, and that's it. That's what income tax is for. That was why the IRS was created after the Federal Reserve was created. They were created simultaneously. Hey, we're going to have a private cartel 
issuing the nation's currency and we need a bunch of slaves to, to, to hold it up for us for an extended period of time. How, how can we find that many willing stupid slaves who would actually submit to a system like that? <gasps> Citizens of a democracy! How brilliant! <laughs> well, you know, I hear now, just the other day, uh, I was contacted, I guess, GW Pharmaceuticals in England. They get up on the internet and they come out against me. You know, what an upstanding, wonderful country or company, you know, that uh, it produces, you know, hemp based medicines like at about four or five hundred dollars a gram. You know, these are upstanding people. Not much wonder they're criticizing me, the guy who wants to see everybody have it for practically nothing. You know, and of course, GW, I think GW is either, well, I know Bayer distributes their products here in Canada and probably Bayer owns them. And, you know, they put this big clip thing up on the internet, but they didn't allow any comments. I wonder why. You think they might have got blasted? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Bayer, GW Pharmaceuticals, and a whole damn bunch of them, they can all go to hell. This is a simple damn truth that I've told the public. And whether they like it or not, one of these days in the near future, they're going to be gone. I think I think it's a part of the responsibility of anybody who knows that eventually these people aren't going to be there to simply hasten it, you know? Like, if you, if you see a boulder that's about to um, uh, fall off a cliff... Uh, kind of thing. Just, just, just give it a little bit of a nudge. It's all it needs. <laughs> but you know, we could just get these people. If, if the people would understand, you know, I don't want violence here. I don't want any big deal like that. Just stand together and look at your politicians and tell them point blank. Look, we've had enough of your nonsense, and that goes for the legal systems and everything. Now, if you don't start working for us, you're out of a job, and you're gonna, and it's gonna happen quick. So, I mean, this is what we got to do. We got to take back our world, and we need honest representation. And and it's more than obvious that we're never going to get it with any of these political parties because they're all corrupted right to the damn core. They're, they've been bought and paid for for decades. I also believe that that it won't be possible with a, a continued centralized government. I mean, I think that centralization is the very antithesis to freedom. Right. Well, you know, you know, my well, my as far as I'm concerned, I don't even believe in borders, and I don't believe in countries. Get rid of the damn borders and then we could all intermingle and we'd learn to get along a whole hell of a lot better than we do now because it would promote understanding. You know, and as a human being, I mean, does anybody have the right to tell you that you can't go live in Siberia or in Canada or anywhere else you want to go? You know, why, why do they presume that they have that right to tell us? You know, we don't tell a rabbit where to go live, do we? Well, you know, it, we do exterminate them if they're living in a place where we don't want them, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, it, it, we could make things so much better so so quickly. But, you know, my, what, my, my heart goes out mostly, well, I've got a real affection for animals and treating animals and children. You know, and I mean, if an adult is stupid enough to not even look into their, their own problems and find solutions for themselves, well, that's their problem. But children are different. You know, and, to, and right, as we speak right now, there's children, thousands of children worldwide dying in these damn hospitals, you know, taking chemo and radiation. And th these doctors are simply brutalizing these children. Now, I mean, I know we know what can cure them. Now, it's like I said, now, why the hell isn't the medical system using it? And, you know, in this insanity with chemo and radiation, I mean, I don't know. I know how they I know how they put it in place, but I don't know how they maintain it. You know, I, I've said before a thousand times you're using cancer causing treatments to treat cancer. Now, if that's not the if that's not the definition of insanity, I don't know what the hell is, Vinny. That's like, um... A patient comes in with a gunshot wound, and so you shoot him in order to make him better? Yeah. You know? shoot, shoot him again. <laughs> You'll feel yeah. better. Shoot him again. Maybe that'll work. Um. <laughs> Get a toothache. You'd always take a stick of dynamite and put it in your mouth like a cigar, and I think that'll solve your toothache. Yeah, yeah. See, I've always thought the the, uh, the bureaucracy of, the, of this particular um, ideology, any, any institution, of, you know... I think I really am just anti-establishment in, in any way, shape, or form. Maybe because it's a, I'm not naive enough to think that we actually have an establishment, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, look, 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 what defines an establishment? Something that's actually established. What is something that's established? Something that works and is uh, self-regulating and supports itself and doesn't have problems. <laughs> None of those parameters are, are fulfilled with any establishment. Right? Yeah. Now, see, the reality is, I'm actually pro-establishment, but I'm actually pro-real establishment. The, the other people who think that they're pro-establishment are actually just pro-tyranny. 
pro scumbaggery and 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 I, I can't that just doesn't fly with me and speaking of speaking of things that don't fly you know how the uh united states has this massive no fly list right well this is just a random topic completely off topic but uh, i was talking to my producer the other day and um the new zealand government's gonna uh, wind up deporting him or might might do and um we thought maybe because he's um been the producer of the show for a number of years that he might be on the no fly list so we're thinking it would be really funny what if the new zealand government came in here stuck him on a plane sent him to the united states and then homeland security said no no no, we can't we can't let you deport u.s citizens back to the u.s they're on the no-fly list (laughs) so 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 the draconian homeland security would actually prevent americans from coming back under their own dominion because of their bureaucracy i thought that would be really hilarious uh and and we're up to break now in, in, in either case so ladies and gentlemen don't you fly anywhere we'll be right back with rick simpson from <laughs> phoenix friends countrymen russians welcome back to the Vinnie eastwood show broadcasting live <laughs> from the vodka soaked news bunker in southern siberia <laughs> Bordering with, uh, 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 bordering with uh, Chechnya and uh, partying up with uh, people that have legs blown off and, sh- and stuff. You listen to the <laughs> Vinnie Eastwood show, it's the, it's the lighter side of genocide because in a world so full of chaos and madness and uh, napalm uh, explosions, if you lose your sense of humour, you go friggin' nuts. My very special guest is Rick Simpson from phoenixtears.ca and uh, we're talking about all the old... Um, uh, we're talking over the break with uh, Adam, our board op, who's going through a little bit of a hard time right now. And and I've I've said it on the, on the times um, on the radio many many times before. Uh, the guys at AFR, oh my god, oh my god, did they have some hard work to do? Like if, every single day, it's it's it, it's constant. You know, 10, 14 hour days, six days a week, uh, unpaid for the unpaid for the most part. Uh, producing me, producing Kevin Barrett, producing uh, Christopher Green and uh, Pete Santilli and uh, all of the other, uh, uh, Christy and, and all, all these other real um, great hosts that we've got on the network and, and things like that. It just takes so much energy to, to put things together for other people. And I wonder if anybody puts enough energy to put things together for them. That's why I... Um, I made that ad that runs on American Freedom Radio now, encouraging people to uh, to uh, donate to American Freedom Radio um, and also to uh, volunteer. Uh, American Freedom Radio at ymail.com is the email list if you want to um, send in and volunteer. You know, they'll, they'll tutor you, they'll mentor you, they'll, they'll teach you how to produce uh, real high quality radio okay Dan- danny romero's been in the, in the in the biz and talk radio for for uh, like close close to a decade plus or anything like that has uh, the biggest associations with the with the biggest and best talk radio uh, people in 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 the game basically uh salt of the earth type character right if you want to get involved i encourage you to do so um and and if they're going through harsh times i know that times must be very harsh indeed um and I, I i don't know i don't know what it is about me i'm always trying to help people and uh, and rick i told you before the show today uh about my uh, my mate mikhail he's actually sitting sitting right right here next to me in the studio today um yeah. we were uh at, at another listener's house uh, dan's last night and uh mike had, mike had only had three hours sleep uh hadn't had much water all day uh mm-hmm. had done like <coughs> eight ten hours of painting it was tough work eh? and um and, and he and he blacked out and he and he fell backwards like we were, we we're on a balcony right with a with a a railing that couldn't have been more than couldn't have been more than two feet off the ground kicked his legs right up <coughs> sailed down over over the balcony and uh hit the concrete head first uh good good three meters so, good three meters ten feet that's below that's that's how you end up with the kind of damage that I have. You know, I, I had the same thing, a head injury, and it put a six-foot fall, land on your head, and that can ruin your life real quick. 
Well, it, it was incredibly lucky um, that he was uh, that he passed out and 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 and, and fell off as well because it is real real limp um, kind of thing. If you if you know that you're falling, you you tense up and you and the impact affects you more. That's why, um, ironically, if you're going to get into a car crash, it's actually best if you're the drunk driver. <laughs> Because because you because you're to, you're totally limp. Um, I think yep. that's probably why they um, made drunk driving illegal. You know because they love death. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's a cons- <laughs> now see that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, but but in either case, um, I consider myself to be the man to go to in a crisis. Right. So, uh, ran ran down the bo- bottom there, picked him up, laid laid him down, and and um, he'd been unconscious for about maybe thirty seconds, and and they, and they woke up, and the first thing he says is, "No, I'm fine. I'm fine." <laughs> it's like after seeing him fall back, I was like, whoa, 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 yeah, I don't care what you say, bro. I'm, we're taking you to the uh, the emergency thing now." When it comes to the medical industry, and I, and I will say this, they kill more people than they save. Uh, they don't know how to treat disease. They don't know how to treat mental problems. But when it comes to trauma, modern medicine is the bee's knees. You got an arm cut off, finger cut off, head tra- head trauma, or, or, or a broken bone, something like that. You definitely want want that emergency room. No amount of uh, herbology or naturopathy or anything like that is gonna is gonna cure you from a head gash. All right. Um, so you get in there, you get you some stitches, and you get on out. Um, and I, I stayed there with him for for about maybe uh, three hours, I think. Uh, just mm. kept bringing him water and uh, kept talking to him and kept making him laugh and, and stuff like that. You know the Patch Adams methodology. You know, you, you can you can cure a lot of people with laughter. And you know you, you you know me, Rick. I can I can force a few cackles if I choose. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and and um, uh, the nurses and, and doctors and everything like that. And like uh, my mate Dan, he, he drove us to the hospital. So and he was about to leave, and I was just say, yeah, yeah, man, I'll, I'll stay here with him because I know that these um, these doctors and nurses and everything like that, they'll they'll try and give him vaccines. They'll try and uh, pull tubes of his blood and put it put it on file and and uh, do all of this other stuff that we know that they do. Um, you know, they want to give him uh, radiation and, and and all of this other sort of stuff. And it's like we don't want any of that. Um, so I'm I'm kind of you know. He's very lucky that his friend is Mr. News, you know, <laughs> you know, just, just literally there. I know all the, I know all the methodologies. I know all their tricks, you know, I, I made sure to like go onto the, the, the wall just across from his bed to, uh, to read the patient's rights out sheet that you can't be pressured into anything and you have the right to inform consent and everything like that and just took some mental notes and, and, you know, he came out of there with stitches and 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 drank a few cups of water and that's it had i not been there he may well have had a tet been pressured into a tetanus shot may well have had a uh, a full tube of his blood being pulled and he doesn't like having his blood pulled at all bro it freaks him out you know he gets he gets faint even if he's healthy uh <laughs> and um what what else was was there going on there uh, they wanted to scan his head you know dose him with a bit, bit of uh, radiation and things like that there was no skull fracture he wasn't um nauseous or vomiting a three meter fall onto his head, and he didn't even so much as suffer a proper concussion, right? Nothing short of a miracle. Not exactly, Vinny. Mm. They, they actually they proved that uh, you know by people that smoke cannabis, just smoking cannabis provides a great level of, of protection for for head injuries. Uh, there's a, a fellow out there who wrote a book. His name is Martin Martinez. Uh, he wrote a book called The New Prescription. It's all about cannabis. And uh, he had a motorcycle accident with no helmet. They never thought he'd be right in the head again. But because he was a heavy cannabis user, he healed up very quickly and he came right back to normal. So having the, the cannabinoids in your system, it, it is like an invisible protection for head injuries. Hmm. Well, it, appe- it occurs to me that it's an invisible protection for everything. Um, Bob, Bob Melamy well, yes. told me... Um, <laughs> Even against alcohol, uh, alcohol uh, damages and destroys brain cells. Um, but what happens if you uh, have ingested cannabis beforehand? The uh, the cannabinoids form a protective seal around your brain cells, and they prevent alcohol from damaging them. And um, right. this is this is very interesting because a lot of people say you don't combine alcohol, don't com- don't combine cannabis. And um, what I found, at least from uh, personal experience, and, um, and 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 a number of different people that I know that have that have of course used both at the same time, what happens is if you're really drunk already, and then you and then you start smoking weed, mate, you will go off the rails. You will start feeling sick. You'll get nauseous and stuff like that. That happened to me one time at, at a dance party. 
um, and uh, I don't recommend that. But if you smoke before you start drinking and then uh, uh, start consuming, you you tend to drink slower and uh, the effects are, are, are nowhere near as bad kind of thing. And in fact, even hangovers are, are, are less intense. And it, it's quite an interesting thing, just, just the order in which you take them. Well, it's amazing the difference it makes to drinkers because I know when I got off the, the liquor when I was in my mid-30s, you know, before I used to go to a dance or something, before I went to the dance, I would smoke a joint. But I mean, normally before the before I started with the with the hemp, I, I would go to a dance. I would drink Christ for a twelve beer, eighteen beer, who knows, maybe a twenty four. You know, I had a capacity for this stuff. But all of a sudden, smoke the joint, go to the dance, d- dance, have a good time all night, drink two beer, go home, wake up the next day, no hangover, no headaches. I found that to be much better. <laughs> and it's it's great for getting people off alcohol and any of these addictive substances you know opiates alcohol you name it the oil helps you get you off these substances and it's the best thing you can do for your body mm. uh, indeed um i had a uh, f- uh maori friend uh dr totoku who was uh, very much involved uh, in the Maori community, she, what they call the Maori warden, you know, volunteers who uh, who walk the streets like security guards and and, and, and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And she's managed to get a number of uh, her family and friends and uh, just 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 general people she meets on the street off of uh, methamphetamine, uh, off of extreme alcohol abuse, and she, and she and she she just you know insists and uh and if they if if they refuse or anything like that she'll even roll a joint for them and 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 deliver it around there for for them you know it's just just like i don't i don't care man you know this is really really that's really bad for you this is really good for you here it is i'm not going to charge you for it or anything just just take it just use it you know because i'm concerned about your health care and it's like have you noticed that you don't need qualifications in healthcare in order to care for somebody's health. <laughs> Quite true, Benny. <laughs> and indeed, you if you do have, and indeed, if you do have qualifications in healthcare, I think it's even less likely that you care about people's health. <laughs> well, you know, it really, I mean, healthcare workers are really a special breed, and uh, I mean, they they should be people that have deep concern and compassion for others. That should be the first prerequisite. For anybody working with patients, but unfortunately, that is not the situation we're in today. Because you know, I mean, the most of the bottom line is to these doctors, we're just a number, you know, in a way to, to milk the cow to make more money. That's all it is to them. So I don't consider people like that as being good healthcare, you know, professionals. And I actually, I'm I'm sad to say, Vinny, after 25 years of working in a hospital myself, I can actually say that I've only come in contact with maybe three people over all of those years. That I would consider to be good healthcare professionals. Few and far between, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Bill Deagle told me uh, once that if you have the letters MD after your name, you are statistically eleven times more likely to be a serial killer, not just a murderer, but a serial killer. Well, all I got to do is give the people the chemo and the radiation. What are you? You're a serial killer. Well, I was also <laughs> thinking about this last night. You know, um, it'd be cool if you could. I don't know, but have some sort of a children's program uh, to teach kids about this, you know, like you could have uh, Tickle Me Chemo or something like that, you know, like a... Like a... <laughs> Tickle Me Chemo. <laughs> Tickle Me Elmo, yeah, <laughs> chemo. <laughs> Why not? You know, he could, well, he could have a so chemo what... blanket. we, we got to start educating the young people to reality. I mean, most of the older people seem to be too brainwashed to accept anything. So this is what I look at, and this is the reason I like to get into these universities and get to these young minds, to wake them up before it's too damn late. Yeah, I mean, hey, time is short, and I think I had a realization when I was really young, Rick, time never never waits for me. Like, it doesn't slow down when I want it to or, or speed up when I want it to or anything like that. Um, and, and I deal with time the same way I deal with my relationships with people. If I don't give anything, I don't, I don't, I don't get anything or, 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 vi- or vice versa. So time never waits for me. So I'm never going to wait for time. Uh, mm-hmm. Time's a waste and that, that kind of thing. I always want to do as much as I, as I can right now while I'm still alive. You know, it, it's, it's like, Vinny, are you still alive right now? Yes, I am. Well, I should be exposing some scumbaggery then, I reckon. <laughs> You're right, brother. <laughs> 
I think we prioritize relaxation um, uh, quite a bit because it's, I don't know, life's really hard and um, I don't... I don't think any of us really want to live a harsh and uh, and painful and and stress filled life. Um, so in a case, in in a way, it's actually really really beneficial to prioritize your relaxation time and things of that nature. But often we do it at the expense of the moment, at the expense of uh, opportunities when we could be doing something uh, that's uh, really needs to be done or really productive right now. Um, and and I've noticed sometimes, even when you think you're really tired. Or uh, even after you've been injured or something, you can still accomplish a heck of a lot, right? I remember this one time. Um, I think I was doing community service after I got busted for uh, dealing when I was when I was much much younger, and um, I, I fell off a, a, a two two and a half meter, you know, eight foot retaining wall uh, on my on my bicycle and uh, landed on my head, uh, and the bike was fine, but I was messed up, and my mum uh, wasn't having any of it. All right. Seriously, she she just said, "I don't care. You still have to ride the fourteen kilometers down um, down to the reserve. You know, up and down hills and things like that. You still have to work a full day uh, uh, pulling weeds and uh, chopping wood and um, uh, <laughs> and and maintaining a park and delivering um, wheelbarrow loads of gravel and everything like that with a with a messed up neck and a, and a hurting head and a, and a messed up back and everything like that. And I did it." Right. <laughs> you know, you, we're all capable of things that, that we don't think we are, right? It's only whether or not we have to do something uh, often is, we is when we find out how much we can do. All right, well, we can deal with adversity if we want. Yeah, if we want to. We'll be right back, or if we have to, we'll be right back after the break with Rick Simpson from phoenixtears.ca. And I think after the break um, as well in the second hour, we might be having Jan Irvin from Gnostic Media back in a minute. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show, categorised by every day I am hustling like Rick Ross, under Operation Pegasus and the CIA shipped all the drugs in. <clears throat> Speaking of hustling, you know, it was something that was interesting, Rick. Um, uh, the reason why I started dealing when I was um, uh, young is basically I lost my job as a, uh, as a security guard for kind of an unfair reason. Um, yeah. and also my girlfriend, uh, uh, left to go back to Japan. She didn't break up with me. She just, she just basically thought that everybody was really racist in, in, in New Zealand and she, and she couldn't handle it, um, uh, for a bit. So she wanted to go back home. Um, and then my, uh, flatmate, uh, Liam, uh, left as well to, to go. And, and I was just kind of all alone. Mm. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever started using it. And what I found was when I was selling uh, weed to people, they, w- they would hang out with me and they would smoke with me and, and, and that kind of thing. And I thought these people were my friends. Um, mm-hmm. And as soon as I got arrested, I never saw a single one of those people ever again. Yeah, they disappear <laughs> very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> they ain't your friends. Okay, no, no more than the guy at the uh, convenience store that you're nice and friendly and chatty with is, is your friend. If he didn't have a convenience store, you wouldn't take it, take up your own um, volition to go over and see him and, and stuff like that because you're only buying stuff off him. You know, it's, it's, it's a business. And, and uh, because you're doing something illegal, you, you perceive that there's some kind of a relationship there, some kind of rapport. Um, but incidentally, I was actually dobbed on. So somebody actually knocked on me to the cops. Um, mm. And it was the worst, most horrible experience uh, going through in my life. The, uh, the disillusionment, the, uh, the severe depression, the, the just extreme rage when I, I just thought my entire life was over. And, you know, mm. and, and it actually was. You know, I had a whole life planned out for myself, Rick. I wanted to be a great filmmaker and go to university and film out and be a nice upstanding citizen and all, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, when you get the uh, the jackboot thugs uh, on you and you see all their methodologies and, and uh, you, you have that kind of harsh reality of being in the cells alone and, um, mm. and you kind of have some time, time with your thoughts, nothing's ever the same again. Well, brother, you are an upstanding citizen. Nobody can take that away from you. But, I mean, well, so what? You sold a little bit of pot. Boy, that makes you a real bad person, doesn't it? What you love. Let's talk talk about the real drug dealers here. And then the other day I watched a a documentary on television. It was funny as hell. Now, here's the American Coast Guard going through the, you know, the Panama Canal. And the reason they're doing that is because they need a ship between Colombia and Panama, you know, to stop all the drug running. 
Now, here's the CIA flying airplanes in, loading them with cocaine and flying them back to the United States and addicting the whole damn country, while the American Coast Guard is down there patrolling the waters to keep these drugs out of, out of the, uh, the United States of America. You know, what a pile of BS. And I mean, the, the bottom line is, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, they're, they're down there bothering boaters and things like that. I have no doubt about that. But if they're be, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. They're probably behaving the same as the CIA. They're, the, the Coast Guard is likely bringing in drugs, too. You know, so they, the American government, all the governments, they're the drug dealers. It's not the little guy that, you know, smokes a joint or grows a little bit of pot for himself or be sells a little bit. That don't make you a bad person. Actually, uh, to me, it makes you a hero. Mm. Well, there were a couple of things that I found very interesting is that um, I was very naive at the time and believed that police were honest people who uh, <laughs> are just trying yeah. to do, do the right thing and uh, apply the law uh, liberally and, and, and sort of, uh, it, and so I was very honest with them. He says, yes, I'm a drug dealer. Yes, I've been selling uh, uh, about an ounce a week for about eight months or whatever. And, and, uh, and here's, my, here's, my, here's my bag of, of weed that I'm going to sell. And here's, here's my personal stash. Here's my um, old stalks from old ounces and here's my here's my tinfoil and water you know i gave them everything and they yeah. still made up evidence against me in court <laughs> well, these cops are renowned i mean they, they go on you know they they talk about perjury and all that every time i've ever seen a cop testify every damn time they've lied you know they're the ones that are supposed to be upholding justice you know it, it's so disgusting they're and not the, the ones upholding it people. they're the ones that are well, holding justice down right and the judges are letting them do it. Because the judges are there to do that exact same thing. And, and, and here was the interesting thing about sentencing, right? There's, there's um, two people in front of me like uh, when, when I was being sentenced. First guy, uh, maybe about uh, 50, 50, 55, 58 years old, right? Wearing a moth-eaten uh, 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 cardigan. A uh, former heroin addict. Who, and, he's, and he's there because he stole a jar of Craig's raspberry jam from the local BP service station. Okay? And... <laughs> Right, being prosecuted for that by BP, <laughs> and he was ordered to uh, pay reparations to BP of four dollars and fifteen cents to replace the jar of Craig's jam. <laughs> How much did they pay the lawyer to prosecute him? How much time did it take off the court to do this? You know, thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, and and the guy and the next guy in front of him, he was up for uh, uh, sexual assault of, of his girlfriend. Resisting arrest and cultivation of three plants, okay? He gets 150 hours community service. Me, I'm up there with 13 grams of cannabis ready for sale. I get 300 hours community service. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, you're the bad guy. <laughs> I was the bad guy. Hey, and I was lucky I didn't go to jail for up to eight years for a first offense, all right? We've got this thing in this country called diversion, which, if you have a first offence, you can get off it if it's if it's a minor crime or whatever. But but selling pot is considered as serious as manslaughter in this country. Oh, well, even more serious, Vinny. Even more serious. I mean, I'll tell you right now, Vinny. If anybody ever put me in jail over pot, when I got out, I wouldn't want to be the judge that put me there, because it would be payback time, as far as I'm concerned. You're not going to damn well ruin my life without me coming and ruining yours. You know, they're the, they're the criminals. What? We, we smoke man's oldest known and safe medication that's been smoked and used by civilizations for thousands of years, and we're the bad guy? Not like hell we are. They're the bad guys. They're all in the back pocket of the big money, and the reason they're per persecuting us is because the big money don't like us. I'm, 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 I'm for one, grateful uh, that I got arrested and persecuted. Had I not been... Had I not gone through that trauma, had I not gone through that disillusionment, I may have right. lived the entire rest of my life without ever noticing that there was a, hum a problem with humanity that needed to be solved and I can actually contribute. Well, that was the same thing that happened to me, Vinny. I mean, is it because of my injury and everything? When I seen the reality of what this wonderful plant can do, I just couldn't believe that they're not using it. I thought they would instantly jump on the bandwagon. My God, we need to heal people, don't we? And then you give them the information, you give them the evidence, and then they turn around and prosecute you. You know, what a wonderful country. And it's, a, it, you know, it's just enough to make me jump right out of my chair and sing, oh, Canada. I mean, this country sucks to high heaven. It's not the country. It's a beautiful country, but it is run by nothing but criminals. And I don't know what's wrong with the Canadian people. Why the hell they won't get off their asses and demand something better? 
Well, see, and it's not just the Canadian people, it's the New Zealand people, it's the American people, it's, yep. it's, 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 it's the people, uh, uh, pl- uh, infinitum plural. What is the difference between somebody who gets messed round and disillusioned and chooses to accept it uh, to, say, people like you and I, Rick, who, who have that exact same experience that many, many right. others have had, and then instead of letting it kill us, we instead devote our lives to saving and preserving human life. What is the difference between the, um, those people and us? I don't know what it is. Well, I mean, if, if, if what took place with you was the cause of you doing what you're doing today, and the same with me, if it's the cause of what I'm doing today, I'm like you, I have no regrets. Because I think I'm doing the most important thing that I've ever done in my life. And I believe you're doing the same. Yeah, this reminds me of something Chris Green asked me. Is Vinny, if if twenty if December twenty first, twenty twelve was the end of the world, would you start doing anything <laughs> different? And I was like, you know what? No, I think I'm doing no. the most important stuff I could ever conceivably do. The most enjoyable thing that I've ever done. Uh, wouldn't change a thing. What? What? No. The world, world's ending. Therefore, I'm going to stop enjoying myself and and stop doing the right thing. <coughs> Please. I wish they. Would, I wish they would stop coming up with this world ending nonsense. I've, it's like I said, I lived through the end of the world too many times, brother. You know, it gets it gets lame after a while. <laughs> yeah, the end of the world is getting old, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've heard it too often, and uh, you know, I you know again, you know, I th- I think that this stuff is just put out there for distractions. You know, look, we're going to get hit by a planet. The world is going to end. It scares every while. Well, it scares some people. Me, I just ignore it all and laugh at it. And, and that's Mayan calendar. I've, told, I've been telling people for a long time, is that this Mayan calendar is just a bunch of nonsense. You know, we probably are entering a new age of enlightenment. And it's high damn time. But it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah. Well, incidentally, we're going to have uh, Jan Irvin on uh, after the break. He's a bit of an advocate of yours as well. Um, and we, we talk with him. Uh, on December the, uh, 21st, 2012, and actually goes through what's in the Mayan calendar. You know what the Mayan calendar predicted for December 21st, 2012, and, and, and the the whole prediction? Mm. A new king would be crowned. And that's it. Well, did you get a crown? I no! I didn't get one. Nah, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> you see, but the thing is, people people make up this distortion and stuff like that. They make an entire industry off of doomsday propaganda, don't you think? And you know what happened to people back in the day if they made predictions that didn't pan out? They got stoned to death, and not in a marijuana kind of way. Rick, thank you very much for your, <laughs> for your time here tonight. It was a pleasure, Vinny, as always, brother, and I'm happy to come on any time I'm available. Yeah, well, we'll talk over the break as, as well, and uh, and and maybe uh, maybe Jan Irvin might want to um, have a have a chat with you in the next break. We'll we'll, we'll see, we'll see. All right, thank okay, you, very, brother. Thank you very much. If this is um, if this is it, this is it. Otherwise, tune in uh, after the break, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll at the very least have Jan Irvin uh, from Gnostic Media. He cuts off fallacies like a uh, uh, like a professional castrator. He's he's quite an amazing guy. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is now hour number two of the fastest two hours in talk radio. It's the Vinnie Eastwood Show, the lighter side of genocide, because in a world so full of chaos and madness, if you lose your sense of humor, you'll go friggin' nuts. We're broadcasting live from the fabulously fluoridated capital of Auckland, New Zealand, the island change nation in the sunny slave South Pacific. It's nice, hot, and then there is a aroma of sweaty ballsack in the air. My very special guest, speaking of which, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that wasn't appropriate for FCC regulations, actually, and, and there's probably a lot of uh, people out there who are offended by that statement, and I don't apologize. Yeah, you know, what, what, what goes, is my guest. <laughs> goes in your does not go here, you know. <laughs> mm, mm. All right, so we've still got Rick Simpson, and, and now we're also uh, joined by Jan Irvin, and these, these two haven't actually met before, um, which is good because, uh, you know, Jan, Jan's uh, uh, very, very well knowledgeable about pretty much anything, and, and, and uh, cannabis is, uh, is a big topic for him as well. No heaps that, about it. Simpson, uh, cannabis oil, Rick Simpson. That's that me. Right. Oh, hi, of course we know each other. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, I had you on my show several years ago. Okay, <laughs> I've done so many. I've done like everybody, like Vinny. I think I lost track of them all. Yeah, well, I was a good friend of uh, Jack Harris for eighteen years, and um, 
You know, I, I knew, uh, you know, I was aware of the situation when you were in Europe for a while. Where are you now? Uh, right now I'm in Canada, but I'm only, I'll be leaving again in about a month. I, I don't think I'll ever live in Canada again. I've had enough of, uh, you know, the British Empire, I believe. <laughs> right. Well, uh, how did you, so they dropped the charges against you or what happened? Yeah, they, they went through the charges last spring. I mean, the charges were all bogus anyway. They, the, the RCMP here in Canada were trying to frame me because that's what the government wanted. But uh, no, I, I mean, it's changed my outlook on, well, it's changed my outlook on Canada. It's changed my outlook on the whole world. But I, I certainly envy you, sir, for having the, the honor of knowing Jack Hare for 18 years. Uh, I knew Jack for about a year and a half, two years before he passed away. And uh, that man affected my life in so many ways. I mean, like when he died, I remember I tried to write a piece for the Internet and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I, I never even met Jack face to face. We've talked many, many times for hours on the phone. But when I tried to write like something about him to put on the Internet, the tears would just flow. I, I couldn't control them. And I mean, I'm not the kind of guy that cries. So I can't even describe the effect that Jack Hare had on my life. But it, it was an honor to get to know the man. And I think he's the greatest leader the hemp movement ever had. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think so. And uh, he was a good friend of mine for a long time. And I threw dirt on his grave and uh, all of that. Um, I'm just looking up your uh, show here on my website to see when you were on. You were on Jack Hare and Rip, Rick Simpson interviews, Cannabis Run from the Cure. And that was episode number 17 from February 8, 2009. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been a while, huh? <laughs> Well, I hear interviews sometimes. I know a friend of mine, he'll play them to me. And I don't even remember doing them. You know, I've done so many of them now. Sure. But it's great to be able to get the word out and through people like Vinny and yourself. I mean, you know, we're all working together here. And, um, and brother, we're, we're going to change this world. We're going to make it a decent place. And it's got to happen in the near future. Well, hopefully so. But, you know, one thing I've discovered is that we've got to stop uh, believing in government to solve our problems because they're the ones that created the mess in the first place. And, um, you know, so uh, the ad vericundium fallacy is what government is based on. And in fact, my most recent show, we did a uh, episode with Jose Barrera that talks about supernatural uh, magic and spelling is mind control. And essentially what these guys do, these elites, what, they, they put on fancy costumes, they perform a little ritual, and then they write something down, and then they get a herd of people to believe it. See how that works? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's purely magic, and it's a ritual. And mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the entire foundation of government is based on this, and it's also based on the ad vericundium or appeal to authority fallacy. So, you know, essentially it's the entire thing is based on you giving up your autonomy to somebody else every time you go and vote, et cetera. And the whole thing is based on black magic and rituals. So once you're aware of how it's just magic and spelling and spelling, literally writing something down, just like, you know, the, in ancient times, how they would create a, a god to do their deeds is mm -hmm. they would write it down. So you write a book about it. You write the New Testament and you say, Yahweh gives me everything in Israel, Jerusalem, blah, blah. And then you just cast that spell. And then you get all these people to go around and kill everybody who don't want to support your, your Zionism, right? And mm -hmm. it's just by these Levitical priests who cast that spell 23, 2400 years ago or whenever they cast it. Mm. Have you ever seen those um, television shows where a magician will do a trick that appears really amazing, but then the, after they've performed the trick in front of you, they explain how you did it, right? Sure. Well, you know, Dar Darren Brown, the, the uh, British ma magician, uh, he exposes how all of this kind of stuff works, and that's what his show has been dedicated to for like eight or ten years now. In fact, uh, uh, recently he did a whole expose on uh, mind control through hypnosis, and if you could get somebody to go out and assassinate somebody else, such as, uh, oh, what's his name from the uh, Bobby Kennedy assassination? Um, Sir Sir Han, Sir Han. Yeah. And and he pulled it off successfully, and he got somebody to walk into a movie theater, pull a, a gun loaded with blanks, and pull it on. Uh, uh, the, who was the guy from um, V for Vendetta? One of the lead actors from Hugo that movie. Weaving. 
Right. Got the got got this guy to go in, pull the gun on him and pull the trigger and uh, right in front of a whole audience full of people. And so this type of mind control is possible. But see, that's the extreme point of it. And what people don't get is that mind control, et cetera, is so much simpler than those types of extravagant things. And I just gave the example of, uh, you know, of of that and. (laughs) the uh, the whole spelling and writing laws and things like that. But another way that that uh, that mind control is is used is just by logical fallacies and people that don't study their grammar and logic. So anybody it, who can I anybody who, who studies their logical fallacies is very much is, is far more difficult to mind control than somebody who doesn't know them at all and who believes whatever fallacies that come their way. Do, do you reckon that the, uh, the possibility for mind control is not entirely dissimilar from the Jedi mind trick, like it only works on the, on the weak-minded? This isn't the Colorado shooter you're looking See, for. It was, you know, what, what makes a weak-minded person, but, you know, typically, but a lack of uh, primary education. See, all they had to do, is, as you and I talked about last time, Vinny, was... Uh, get people to put their logic before their grammar. You, all you have to do is get people to try and explain why before they ask who, what, where, or when, right? And they well, will the always how. come to a false conclusion. Well, f- how is how you explain something afterward. It's who, what, where, when, why, and how. So, you know, you gather in your information, you process it, which is logic, removing all of the fallacies, removing the contradictions out, and then you express it, how, the rhetoric to other people. And all they do is they simply get people to put why before who, what, where, and when, or logic before grammar. And so when you look at the old, uh, the ancient classical seven liberal arts of the trivium and quadrivium, uh, you know, in fact, they trivialize the trivium so that it's no longer important in our Wundtian PhD system. But what they've done is they've gotten people to stop thinking critically simply by getting them to believe, well, in 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 uh, Immanuel Kant, for instance, uh, he's probably the worst of all of them because he's created this whole, you know, uh, meme out there today that you can't know truth, that you shouldn't trust your five senses, that you shouldn't go out and verify any citation or anything, and so and then that goes uh, as David Harriman, who I had on my show, uh, shows as <clears throat> as well as in his. Uh, lecture series, The Philosophic Corruption of Physics, is that it was Immanuel Kant who created this entire nonsense of quantum physics, which, of course, goes straight into the New Age movement and all of the uh, pillow-sitting positive thinking, hey, you know, don't show me anything. That's negative. You know, the government would never do that. Uh, This person would never do that. That could never happen. That's too negative. You know, so it's this whole process of killing the messenger and using fallacies to dismiss information rather than verifying them yourself first and saying, hey, you know what, this person is actually telling the truth. So, you know, and and whenever uh, you bring up this type of stuff, people who have fallen hook, line, and sinker for quantum physics will tell you, well, you know, there is no truth. Truth is arbitrary. Really? Is one plus one, five, ten, twenty? Tell that to the grocer next time she steals your money when you go to the store. Every time you park your car in the parking lot out front, isn't it a different spot when you walk out? Really? Is truth (laughs) arbitrary? (laughs) <laughs> Are you that dumb? Really? So, you know, why don't you just, you know, wish your car right over here? I mean, seriously, if you really believe that your car is going to be in a different spot every time you walk out of the store, or maybe even you're in Uranus, you know, the planet, excuse me, um, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, these people really have to snap out of this. You can find truth. One plus one is always going to be two. And, uh, you know, if you take two apples and you put them together, you're going to get four apples. And it's going to happen like that every time. And it's when you find a contradiction or, or irrationality, this is when you know that there is a lie. The second somebody tells you two plus two is five, you go, ah, I see what you're up to. And so then, you know, you have to be able to use common sense and filtering the the fallacies and BS out of your thoughts, not just the information that's coming in, but what you send downstream as well. Mm. Yeah, I've always found that we, we live in it. We live in a world full of illusions, and um, the the biggest problem with that is that we continue to delude ourselves. And a friend of mine was criticised by a friend of his, saying, "Oh, you're just disillusioned," and you're like, "Really? Are you criticising me, saying I'm no longer operating under a delusion?" 
<laughs> you know, I, I, love, I love Bob Alamede's take on this too, because uh, Bob always says, you know, all of these people that are standing there against the use of this medicine, you know, all of those misinformed masses, Bob simply says they're cannabinoid deficient. And I think he's right. Well, you know, <laughs> endogenous cannabinoids are an, are an important part of the entire serotonin system and how the, the whole body works. So, um, you know, and it's, it's funny as I do my best thinking and my best writing and work when I'm high. And in fact, right now I'm not. And I usually don't do radio interviews when I'm not. So I'm having a little moment here right now. Yeah, you're pretty uh, average hey, today, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah hey, Bing, uh, can you bring... Uh, <laughs> Something loaded. Like, honey, <laughs> can you bring one here? <laughs> you can't smoke dope on the internet. <laughs> oh, I live in California. We can do it here. Um, no, but I mean, this is an amazing, you know, the substance itself, the oil and the miracles that it produces is just, it, it's mind boggling. And I understand myself, you know, how people have a hard time grasping it because it took me a long time to grasp it. See, it, no, it only took me two something. fingers to grasp mine. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's so hard to believe that one simple substance can do all of these wonderful things. But, you know, when you see it over and over and over again, like I did, and the beauty of, the, the really the beauty of this whole thing is that I do, is that it can't, be, you know, it can't be disproven. It's so simple. Any fool can go out and make the medicine and prove it to themselves. Well, you, can't, you know, you can't prove a negative anyway. That would be impossible. But, you know, the onus of proof is always on the person making the claim. So you got to be careful of that one. But, yeah, but uh, I think the, the evidence for cannabis and, and cancer and everything is is out there. And, you know, and in fact, right here on my desktop, I do believe I have an entire file that I have saved of cancer study endocannabinoids and thc cancer studies both ready and open and one of them has like 20 the other one is endocannabinoids that we were just discussing mm -hmm. and uh yeah i've got um 19 current medical studies right in front of me on using thc and cannabinoids as uh, treatment for cancers and various types of cancers we've got prostate cancer um <laughs> human glioblastoma multi-form cells etc i love and, it how uh, doctors always just think because they've uh, they're able to say something in latin that it makes them educated like for example you've got osteoporosis really i've got holes in my bones how brilliant of you yes <laughs> you know i hate well, it's, that it's like uh yeah well, go ahead they, they like there, there's a hundred different types of over a hundred different types of cancer you know, and, and a lot of people, when they come to me, they're all, they'll go on, you know, I have this specific type. It's very rare. And I always tell them the same thing. I said, look, I don't care what kind of cancer you have. You know, this oil is an effective treatment for every type of cancer that I've ever come in contact with. And it's like I said, you know, if the oil can't help you, you're not going to find anything that will. And you sure as hell better not look at the medical system to give you any help. Yeah. It's like if the oil can't help you, then God help you. Yeah, that's right. Well, I see. And, and also, if you refuse to use the oil um, and, you, and you'd rather, um, you know, try your hand at some kind of Sesame Street, uh, uh, tickle me chemo type 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 uh, methodology, you know, you're going to die. This is, this is the thing. And, and I remember I told my father this as well, is is uh, he was going to get uh, all, all this treatment and, and stuff like that. And I said, Dad, these doctors are going to kill you. OK, and the. And he did die eventually of it after getting uh, into remission, uh, taking ozone therapy and things like that from a, a naturopath doctor um, that I know named uh, Dr. David Holden, who's brilliant. And he then refused the treatment because he told him, you have to then deal with your emotional issues because there's only so much your, your uh, you, the physical world and everything and can heal you now. You've got to you've got to start um, putting things right with uh, you know your your ex wife you know my mother kind of thing. And instead of putting things right with the ex wife, he's like, oh, I'd rather die than make peace with it. And he died. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's funny that you say that though, uh, Vinny. Is a few years ago I interviewed this woman, Barbara Ehrenreich. She wrote a book called Bright Sided, how the relentless promotion of positive thinking has under, undermined America. And she and a number of other researchers have gone through the medical literature on positive thinking and uh, cancer to see if it has any effect. They can't find any evidence of it whatsoever. 
Well, you know, I mean, if you take, well, when you look at the patients and everything that came to me, the bottom line is if a patient walked in, they wanted a cancer treatment, I gave it, if I had it, I gave it to them. But the thing is, I mean, I would be happy to give a patient two ounces of oil, and I'd be happy to take two ounces of oil myself at the same time while the patient's taking it, because I know what this wonderful substance can do. Now, tell me what doctor, what doctor, if you he gave you chemo, what doctor would take chemo along with you? What doctor <laughs> would take radiation along with you? <laughs> That's well, a they know what this very good point. Two ounces well, hold on, we're coming to break. Up for a week. We're coming to break, <laughs> unfortunately. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Rick Simpson, Yanu. <laughs> You listen to the Vinnie Eastwood Show on AmericanFreedomRadio.com um, and uh, Jan Irvin is my guest from GnosticMedia.com that's Gnostic with a G because he's just so gangster and <clears throat> also there was the other um, uh, thing that I'm really honoured to have Jan on because he gets requests all the time to, to come on people's radio shows and he's done, and he's done so many that it's just kind, kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's past the excitement phase for him uh, the fact that I was able to get him on and at short notice, not 20 minutes before the show started today, um, Jan agreed to come on. I was like, just, whoa, whoa. Like, seriously, bro. You, you, you are quite famous, quite awesome. Um, and as I, um, as I said before the break, before we, uh, we brought you on, you, you cut off fallacies um, like a professional castration artist. Ouch. Hmm. Boy, that sounds dangerous when you put it like that, huh? Mm-hmm. Kind of like the, uh, you turn fallacies into a eunuch, more or less. And, and... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> I, I think you mean to say impotent. Either or. There you go. Hey, well, and, and, you know, last time we talked, we were talking about, uh, I think it was on December 21st, 2012, uh, on, on the Dark Occult of Mysticism show with uh, uh, Frederick and James Wright. And we yeah, talk- that sounds right. Did uh, I ever, you know, I think I posted that to my YouTube page. I forgot to put it up on my website. Oh, well. <laughs> Who cares? Um, and the the thing that we um, uh, discussed on there is is uh, the, how, how very little there was actually predicted for 2012 on the Mayan calendar and how hugely it was blown out of yeah. proportion and how much stuff was just just straight up made up oh i guess i guess the only ones that were right about their predictions were the ones who said it was all bullshit huh pretty much and unfortunately we're under fcc regulation so you can't say uh, that you have to say bs you know and um oh yes excuse me okay so you're on fcc regulations now yeah and uh i at times like these i like to uh remind the fcc if you freedom of speech yeah right I mean, look. You know, have you ever sworn in front of somebody and they get really angry with you and and they say that you're oh, using sure. offensive language? You know what my response to that is? Excuse me, are you over eighteen? Then deal with it like an adult. I don't. I don't get what people what people are. You know, <laughs> trying to trying to tell people um, how how they should speak or shouldn't speak or how they should express themselves and things like that. And and of course, it takes a government agency like the FCC to to, to do something like this because an ordinary, decent, uh, logical person or a rational person just just it was just like well, communications, communications. Well, you, you don't want to listen. You don't have needs- to. Everybody needs mommy and daddy government to handle things for them. Otherwise, everything would just be out of control. And you know who composes mommy and daddy government, but a bunch of us that put on costumes and then go around with clubs and guns and tell everybody else what to do. Mm. Usually the more psychotic amongst us. So, uh, mm. yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll tone it down and keep the FCC off your back. Because when I talked to you out of Australia, you and earlier Remember, you seemed a little free. It's New Zealand. Or New Zealand, excuse me, out of New Zealand. So what show are we on this time? The Vinnie Eastwood Show. It's not out of New Zealand now? It is out of New Zealand, but um, uh, it gets broadcast through AmericanFreedomRadio.com uh, across America, and um, I think I'm just now gaining uh, UK affiliates, and there's a couple of uh, New Zealand affiliates as well. I would love some Australian affiliates. I really, really would. Um, and, and in fact, the uh, Australians, if you, if you have a look at the cities in terms of uh, who who uh, visits the Vinnie Eastwood Show dot com, number one city is my home city of uh, Auckland. Uh, and uh, I think the thir- third one down is like Sydney, Australia or something like that. So there's plenty of Australians that listen to the show, uh, but no ra- radio broadcasters that are brave enough sure. to broadcast it. Well, sure, you know, they're not brave enough to rebroadcast my show either, so. 
Yeah. And my show's been out for going on uh, four and a half years now. So, but you know, it's I've got a, a decent audience, and it's just. You know, my topics are too deep for them, and and they get afraid, I suppose. Well, I think fear comes about when there's no wiggle room. Um, and I've noticed that when you argue or when you make points, you do not leave wiggle room. And so it, it, it basically makes people uncomfortable, and you back people into a corner sort of, sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? How's that? In, in that they can't argue with you. When you come up with an well, argument... Well, uh, no, it's they have well, to they see, have to work really, really hard. I mean, if, if, well, uh, or or, you know, or see, they have to admit they have to admit that they've been wrong. Is my audio still time. working? Yes, is yes, my yes. audio still going? Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you know, see, the issue is, and it goes back to the the trivium and having a systematic method for going through information and filling filtering the fallacies out of the information coming in and out of any information you're sending out. And fallacy comes from the Latin fallare to lie. And so fallacies are, are lies that we tell ourselves and others. Like if I present uh, some information, you know, somebody says, uh, well, you know, they were talking about marijuana. So anything he says can't be valid. Well, that would be an ad hominem attack and they're killing the messenger. So rather than using ad hominem attacks like, uh, you know, there, oh, there's there's a new one. Uh, uh, each day, practically, that I see. This morning, uh, disinfo.com posted uh, my, new, my new episode, and somebody up there said, well, this guy has Christian influence, and the Christians are influencing him. Because I did uh, one interview with Ian T. Taylor, who did an investigation 28 years ago on Darwin and the New World Order, and he came across much of the same information that I did on my recent article uh, investigating... Uh, Gordon Wasson and uh, Aldous Huxley and Terence McKenna, et cetera, uh, regarding the foundations of psychedelics. And all of a sudden, I realized that Julian Huxley was a part of the Eugenics Foundation. Both Julian and Aldous Huxley's grandfather, uh, Sir Thomas Henry Huxley, worked with Charles Darwin and was Darwin's bulldog. And, and these guys are actually who created these very theories. And so, uh, you know, when you, when you get in and you start looking at the evidence, you know, there's here's the evidence. I mean, if you want to sit down and go with me over the evidence, I'll be happy to. But if you're just going to say, well, that guy's a Christian and you're influenced by him, which is a poisoning the well fallacy and a guilt by association because he's a Christian. I'm guilty because I associated with him and therefore none of my research could possibly be valid because of having this one guest on my show of which even in the intro it said, you know, we're going to put our religious differences aside and focus on the research. Those who have studied the trivium should know not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and kill the messenger, and we'll just focus on the work and, uh, you know, be adults about it rather than name-calling to make up excuses and lies about why we shouldn't look into something. Mm. You know, so it's just a really, a really simple process. So if somebody won't look at evidence before they debate you, then there's nothing to debate with them. They're not logical, rational people. You know, oh, Vinny, you know, you have red hair, so you're completely full of you-know-what. And uh, you have a goatee, or you wear a green shirt on Wednesdays, or your uncle's gay, or, or you visited a state that was dominant with Republicans, or when you were a child, you believed in Santa Claus. You know, <laughs> You know, I mean, they'll just make up any sort of irrational nonsense to throw at you. And this guy's whole thing was all of my interviews, all the research, every citation, all my books are invalid because I dared to approach a Christian who had also researched the exact same area 28 years ago. You know, that, that was interesting because um, uh, I think it was like last week I had uh, Glenn Kennedy from uh, InSearch.com, uh, a Christian guy, and uh, one of the people in the chat room said, I can't believe, why is Vinny even entertaining this guy? And I go, it is a show, isn't entertaining the name of the game? That's hilarious. But, you know, you know, and I would just approach it from the other angle is, you know, rather than killing the messenger, why don't we learn what this guy has to say? What if you're trying to figure out something in your life and even if 95% of everything the guy says is BS, what if the, the other 5% that isn't is what you need to save your life? Let's put it in this context for you. 
you know, like the story of the boy who cried wolf or whatever, or, or let's say you live on one side of a hill and there's a village on another side of a hill and, and you're in your village, you're like the village idiot. You cried wolf too many times. You know, you came running down the hill screaming, ah, the enemy's coming once too many times. And you get to the bottom and all the, 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 the army's getting their gear on and everything. And then you just, you're sitting over on the side, ah, <laughs> you know, but uh, if they just ignore you and they know that there is an enemy on the other side of the hill, one day it could cost them. So what is the intelligent thing to do is one day you come to, running down the hill, but this time really the enemy army actually is coming. So what would be the intelligent thing for them to do? Would it be to laugh at you and say, you know, here comes Billy the, uh, Vinny, the village idiot. Uh, why, do, why should we look at him? Or would the, the smart thing be to do to just stick your head up over the top of the hill and look and go, oh, crap, the enemy's coming. Hey, guys, let's get going. So what you're doing is, you know, See, what that is, is it's known as a fallacist fallacy. Even if that person has done this thing before, you don't necessarily discount what he says this time because, you know, what if he's telling the truth? And the fallacist fallacy, even though he's using appeal to fear like Alex Jones or something all over the place, you know, you can uh, recognize that even though these are fallacies, there is still is a necessary process to verify the information provided and just to check it in your five cents reality and make sure that it's real. And so, you know, in some case, it just may save your life or be the exact piece that you're looking for. But, you know, if I had approached this Christian researcher as, you know, who, who spent years researching all this stuff, as this guy's an idiot, he's a Christian, he's got nothing to offer, then I wouldn't have learned anything. But I, you know, read the last two chapters in his book, and he came to many of the same conclusions and offered up more stuff and more leads that I was able to follow. And besides his religious bias, which I can, you know, because I know the trivium and the logical fallacies and appeal to belief and stuff like that, I can hold his fallacies over here out of the way and analyze the rest of his data and take what's valid out of it and, you know, not kill the messenger, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so rather than using an ad hominem attack, you're Republican or you're gay or you're a Christian or you're this or that, you know, look at the research first, take what's valid out of it, toss what isn't. Here's his religious bias. Here's the data and the citations. I can look at this. I can pick up this glass without becoming the glass and I can set it down again. We have to just learn to be emotionally detached from the information and not, you know, allow these fallacies or lies to lead us around like a dog on a leash mm. and uh, speaking of which what, what is your perspective i mean in terms of uh, modern news one thing that's occurred to me is that the news and the vast majority of the things that are reported on it are of no significance or consequence of any kind to anything. They're, they're, they're like completely irrelevant, you know, like like a, a guy's bakery burned down or, or, or something like that. You know, th these things don't matter in the national consciousness. And and what I've found is is that you even though that is my methodology and my and my assumption of the news, I will still watch the news. And there will be one story in, uh, uh, within a half hour of BS that'll still be BS, but will be very important, and that'll actually lead me on right. to a different and, thing. And, and not only and not only that, but if you know the logical fallacies, you can actually reverse engineer what's being said and pull the value or the truth out of it, and then go verify what you need, right? But if you don't know the logical fallacies and how those things work, you cannot. You don't have a way to see it. You just have, you know, you get a funny feeling. See. When you know the logical fallacies uh, by heart, you know, and you've got them where you can just really click them off, you you get you go from that uh, sort of intuitive, funny feeling to, uh, you know, from to confidence. It, it, well, to to confidence and to knowing exactly what's just happened to you. Like if a car salesman's, you know, like, oh, dude, you're going to get all the hot girls if you get this car. Well, you know that that's an appeal to emotion, right? He's trying to pull on your emotions. And so then you can say, ah, <clears throat> rather than a funny feeling, I don't like this guy. He's, I, I think he might be lying to me. You can actually identify the exact lies that he's using against you. And, uh, you know, uh, tri the trivium is really one of the most ancient systems of mind control. The ancient elites, they would, you know, the, the seven liberating or liberal arts were kept for the elites. And then the, the slave classes 
we're given the mechanical and the servile arts, which is what everybody's taught in the uh, compulsory public schools today is the, the servile arts. So basically your education is that of uh, equivalent of a slave, you know, uh, 2000 years ago in ancient Rome. But the but you know the, the they can't use it against you if you learn it. The only way they can use the trivium and these occult arts against you is if you react in ignorance and kill the messenger and don't investigate it uh, before you you know say that you you have sufficient knowledge of it. And that's exactly what they do. Is all they do all they would need to do is label anything occult, and most people will react out of ignorance and fear and not study it, and therefore they become vulnerable just because of their ignorance and fear. Mm. Well, I find that those who are vulnerable and uh, so, such easy prey to, the, to their own ignorance, essentially they, they become their own victimizers. They victimize themselves um, and, and they become such easy prey for liars and thieves and cheats and scumbags. And, and, and sometimes they won't listen, right? They, they won't listen to reason and, and, and those kind of people, you just, you just leave them, okay? Um, the, the you know, worst, you, you say one thing, is. you say one thing and then you, and then you leave them and you can guarantee that somewhere down the track they'll probably hear somebody else say the exact same thing that I told them. They ignored me, but because somebody else is telling them, then they start to think about it, you know? Well, at least you planted the seed. But, you know, the, the biggest offenders that I come across on a regular basis are typically along the new age hippie sort of crowd, the positive mm. thinkers, right? Yeah. And uh, We've only got 10 seconds. Be, yeah, it's, it's positive, unbalanced thinking, not critical thinking and verifying the information. Yeah. And so they're vulnerable to attack. Yeah, it's not critical thinking that is critical of thinking itself. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the final segment of today's show. I want to uh, let all the listeners know um, how intensely grateful I am for your attention. Uh, I've been doing this for a number of years, and uh, anybody who knows my backstory, uh, basically, I've been struggled to be listened to uh, my entire life. The the youngest out of a family of five, uh, 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 fat, opinionated kind of thing. Just just got teased all the all all the frack way through through high school. Um, got fired from jobs because I was smarter than the boss and tried to come up with improved <laughs> method and, and get improved methodologies for the business. And they didn't like people undermining them or making them look bad, so they fired my ass. You know. And now I'm getting appreciated for the first time in my life. And I want everybody to know from all the, all the guests uh, that we have, uh, my mentors, my, my producer, the, the, the guys at AFR, and, and, and particularly the, the listeners as well, you, you've made me feel all complete. Like uh, the, the thing that was listening to my life is, is just being taken seriously and, and, and having people actually care what I've got to say um, as much as I did. And I feel really good about that. Well, good. I, I'm I'm glad uh, you you feel good about that. Hmm. Now, speaking of which, heartstrings. This is what this is the um, a great thing that you pull on people. This is one of the fallacies, isn't it? Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Therefore, take everybody's guns and exterminate the, what children remain. <laughs> sure. Well, of course, that's an appeal to emotion. That's exactly what they do, you know, and and that's exactly what this. Uh, recent Sandy Hook thing is, and there's a lot of, there's too many contradictions in the official storyline, and it, 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 it definitely has the appearance of a false flag operation, and um, I was, uh, I, you know, I posted a, a few articles about it on my Facebook page the other day, I don't have them in front of me right now, but people should definitely look into, uh, you know, the evidence that's building out there, and a lot of it's gaining credibility and yeah, it's absolutely a method of of taking people's guns away, and that's probably the sole reason for it. Because simply, tyranny has a lot harder time taking hold when uh, people have the ability to defend themselves. So, um, you know, this new world order thing has been going on for a long time, and one of the final steps that they really need is to take everyone's guns away. So, you know, just don't have it, and, you know, people really just need to stop listening to these politicians who make up these lies in the first place, and it's a false appeal to authority in the first place. And, uh, the, you know, as Larkin Rose is so clearly pointed out in his work that the you know the the government is the most dangerous superstition and 
you know, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show earlier, were we live when I was talking about how the mind control worked? Do you, did the audience hear that? I can't be sure. Well, yeah. Well, earlier I was, uh, maybe it was off the air, I was uh, mentioning to Vinny about how, you know, the mind oh, no, control No, no, we definitely did talk about it on air. We definitely did. Now I remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Mm. This isn't the shooter you're looking for. Um, and speaking of speaking <laughs> of which, my mate um, uh, Dan told me last night, he saw footage, um, I think it was helicopter news footage, of a dude around Sandy Hook uh, running away from the cops. All the cops chasing him, and they pounced on him and, well, uh, and grabbed him sure. and arrested him in a bush. And then and then after that, the uh, the cops had a press conference, and the uh, the chief of police denied that they caught somebody in a bush. Uh, after a report well, interestingly uh, exactly i think it was exactly a year ago exactly one block away on the exact same latitude line uh they did a uh you know one of these these mock tests terrorist tests or or whatever and it was exactly one block away from where this event took place and uh when you you know it's it, 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 there's always there always seems to be these uh, when these false flags happen, a cover of uh, you know like the London bombing and and uh, uh, Dick Cheney having the you know all of that stuff going on on 9/11 and all all of that. There's always one of these these uh, mock things that they're doing right a in, drill in the back, a drill thank you right in the background going on and um, so uh, uh, one block away from Sandy Hook but. Yeah, if I can find that reference, there was some really good uh, stuff in it. I'll see if I can find it on, on my uh, Facebook page, and I'll excuse me, I'll send it to you, and uh, you can post it up to this show, or you know, maybe interview the person that put it together. Or I don't know what you want to do with it, whatever. Put me in contact with the person. I'm, I'm I'm far more likely to interview somebody for two hours than I am to read their content for two hours. Right. Well, you know, it's actually best to do your grammar and read their content and then interview the person, right? Mm, mm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, 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 it depends. It depends. You, I'm, you I'm really I, bad. I'm really bad at it. And, I, and, and honestly, I need you to I need to actually improve it myself. You, know? <laughs> you and I talked about that last time and you were you had some said something about it. Yeah, here's one of the uh, articles here. And it's uh, a New World Society. And it's um, Sandy Hook Elementary Massacre is possible false flag op. And they've got a whole bunch of videos. And I mean, oh, so uh, one of the things that they show is it's even right out of the Batman movie, this neighborhood that they, that they did Sandy Hook in. It's out, out, right out of the Batman movie. And they showed in the Batman movie this Sandy Hook uh, neighborhood. And they were doing some op in the Batman movie. And this guy exposes this stuff. So uh, here's the link for that. Holy and false flag terrorism, Batman. Yeah, it's at uh, a one world, a, a new world society dot ning dot com. And I suppose you probably just uh, go from there. You can find it all. And uh, but, yeah, it's a pretty extensive article with a number of videos and things up there. And he's got, uh, you know, a lot of uh, good evidence that should make people who are capable of filtering the fallacies out and not kill the messenger. You know, look at the evidence before before you decide its merit. That's key. Look at the evidence, look at the citations, and then decide its value. Don't be like the fool judge in a court of law who thinks he can like judge a case by osmosis and not ever looking at a single bit of evidence because there is no rational, intelligent human being that would ever accept a verdict from such a judge. So we shouldn't ex accept this type of quote-unquote thinking as you know as okay hey, and, and, and here's any another other danger Here, here's another danger I, I believe that the um there's now been talk of investigation and pr even prosecution of people who are postulating alternative theories to the official line of sandy hook have you heard about this i haven't heard that but that doesn't surprise me it's like uh you know they go after these guys who say anything uh you know there's every every event in history historians just go in and they're allowed to find new evidence and publish it and whatever but there's only one event in history that's actually illegal for any historians to do any work on and publish anything new other than the official version and that's world war ii i have never seen any other war or historical event or anything in any other time that was actually illegal 
to investigate or question or, you know, even publish new statistics or scientific findings that even remotely question the, the accepted version. Well, is this um, in relation to uh, Holocaust denial, is it? Well, you know, any of World War II, Holocaust or, you know, they call it Holocaust revisionism or whatever. But, you know, even uh, uh, who's the one uh, expert? Uh, Rosenberg, I think, is uh, or, uh, one of the Holocaust experts. He's dead now. He wrote a three book large series, you know, and he published in there that it was that, you know, he did the death counts. And it was roughly five million. Well, the official version is six million. So even if you you cite their own chief sources, you'll be, you know, labeled as a Holocaust revisionist or whatever, even though these are, are sources that are, you know, and uh, Auschwitz lowered the number, uh, the official number by like a million or something deaths uh, several years ago. And and this is, you know, published right on the outside of Auschwitz. But if you actually talk about it or mention it, then, um, you know, you're suddenly labeled this this crazy person for daring to, you know, uh, talk about uh, actual history and um, not appealing to people's emotions about the thing. I mean, it's like on a plaque right out in front of Auschwitz. You know, I mean, why even argue about it? Just go look at the plaque. It's nothing to get upset about people, you know. I'm not responsible for your reaction to the plaque. All I'm, I'm saying is that there is one. Your, yeah, I'm not responsible for your emotions, your, your inability to do, you know, to detach from them and focus on uh, this little place that we call reality. Have you noticed that people get really emotional when you uh, destroy their their perception of reality? Not their reality, but just their perception of it when you, when you say, well, actually, this is what it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, they get mad at you and they'll name call it you. You know, it's like Terrence McKenna. Wow. You know, you do not question this guy. You know, it's funny, though, is now that it's after December 21st, 2012, I'm starting to get more people saying, hey, you know, wow, I've been following your work for a while. Whereas, you know, even before the day, you know, the emails were like, hey, man, F you. How dare you question Terrence McKenna? My God. And, you know, and I, I choose to believe that he was a good guy and, and did all this wonderful stuff that just fooled millions of people down this road, down this path to, you know, accepting humanism and transhumanism and, uh, you, you know, eugenics philosophies that are based around uh, the UN's Agenda 21 and Fourth World Wilderness Conferences, you know, and it's like stuff right directly out of their Fourth World Wilderness uh, material. And uh, George Hunt has done a lot to expose that stuff. But nobody looks at this and, and connects the dots. They just say, oh, you're attacking my religious or cult hero. Well, I'm sorry. Why don't you just get out of your cult? Yeah, that's what my producer said. As soon as December 21st, 2012 rolled around. Thank God I don't have to listen to a single fracking New Ager ever again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, we, and we should. Back in the day, these people used to be stoned to death if their if their predictions didn't pan out. I'm not saying we do that now, um, but I am saying that we don't believe. Uh, uh, well, basically, we don't even need to hold to beliefs when there are facts well, you know, available. You know, Daniel. Daniel Pinchbeck has already got a whole new storyline, like the Baha'i faith or something he's out there pitching now. I mean, he's just... They just keep moving you know, the goalpost. Up, yeah, they just keep moving the goalpost and pick up whatever nonsense. And I, you know, I've called him out publicly numerous times, and he, you know, he'll, he'll name call and uh, make all seconds. kinds of excuses about it. it. He'll never focus on the um, in, information. He'll always use some appeal to emotion to get his fans to ignore you. Okay. Jan Irvin, GnosticMedia.com. Thanks for coming on, mate. We'll see you again sometime, ladies and gentlemen. No matter where you live, globalism affects you. Did you know that the Vinnie Eastwood Show has more subscribers than New Zealand Herald TV and is New Zealand's most popular YouTube news channel? Where warm-hearted humor and a list of awesome guests talk about crucial issues which the mainstream media ignore. A show where you, the listener, can phone up with questions, comments, and suggestions of guests. Vinny is building a hub to connect truthers with raw information they need to become active. He can help you gain further skills such as website building, producing audio and video, and creating revenue streams in your own multimedia environment. Because Vinny supports such a wide range of people in the truth movement, he is not government or corporate backed and relies entirely on your donations. Give now! 
give generously or subscribe for ten dollars a month for access to ad free video archives just visit the vinnieeastwoodshow.com and click donate if you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337 531 to order your copy now. Do you realize every day we are being put under constant stress from wireless radiation? What's worse is that you don't even know that it's happening. It puts as much stress on our body as if we had a constant viral infection, draining our energy and sapping our strength, or just making us irritable and fatigued. These wireless fields are being emitted from computers, microwaves, mobile phones, power lines, and any electrical appliance. Now there is a solution. A group of research engineers in New Zealand have come up with an active shielding device that shields you from wireless radiation at a cellular level. Blue Shield comes in three models, a household, portable, and USB that plugs into any computer. The great thing about Blue Shield is it is very affordable and guaranteed to last. A one-off purchase will see you being protected for years to come. Visit AmericanFreedomRadio.com and click on the Blue Shield banner. Blue Shield, brought to you by the Vinnie Eastwood Show.com. 